Welcome to this webinar on the next evolution of WebAssembly, the component model. My name is Sohan Maheshwar and I'm a lead developer advocate at Fermion. So, I'm going to start off with maybe some, with a statement that could be a little controversial, which is, it's really time to reboot software development. And the way we have been building and architecting software all this while has been based on certain assumptions. And now with the next evolution of WebAssembly, these assumptions will change. So really it is time for us to reboot software development. Let me give you an example, right? And this example is called the 2400 hour problem. Now, basically parsing a URL or a URI is, while it is a non-trivial task, it is fairly simple. You have a URL like this that looks like HTTPS, colon slash slash www.fermion.com slash blog and this has a protocol it has a host and it has a path name and sometimes it could have some queries after it as well passing this is straightforward right and every single programming language out there has its own or multiple url parsers that are standards as libraries that are used now here's the thing, um, C++ has one, Java has one, JavaScript has one, uh, Rust has one, if not many. And it estimates, uh, rather we have estimated that it's taken at least 2,400 uh, person hours to actually construct all of these passes from scratch. Each language needs its own, each framework needs its own. Why couldn't we just use a single parser that was created as a specification? Well, the problem is there are so many different languages out there and each of them need their own parsers. Apply the same thing for other specifications, cryptographic uh, keys, all of these computing things that really have specifications but need to be implemented from time to time in every language and framework there is. Well, all of this is going to change with something called the component model. Right? So really in the future, if you're building a JavaScript app, you can say something like, I need a YAML parser. And you can actually grab a YAML parser that is written in Rust because Rust is good at doing things like parsing since it is a low level language. Similarly, you can say like, I need a date formatter. And you can use a Python library because Python is good with numbers to really do that. And all of this in your JavaScript app. How this is going to work? Well, that's what I'm here to tell you. To understand how the component model works in WebAssembly, you need to know a bit about WebAssembly. And the boring answer about what WebAssembly is, is it is another portable bytecode format, which means that it can run anywhere as long as there is a runtime for it. Now, this was originally developed for the web in the mid 2010s, and it was meant to be lightweight, portable, um, security sandboxed by default. And here's the thing, all of these things are good for a browser, but they're really great for the server side and to be serverless. Now, for anything to run on a server, you need access to things like files, clocks, system interfaces, random number generators, and so on. And this didn't exist up until 2018-19 when something called WASI was introduced. This stands for WebAssembly Systems Interface. And this essentially allows you to run WebAssembly outside a browser. So you don't need a browser anymore to do all of the cool things WebAssembly is capable for. It gives you access to files, file systems, clocks, and random numbers, completely independent of a browser or a runtime that is on the browser. And it extends Wasm security sandbox to include input output. So for a Wasm file to work with another file, you have to explicitly give it permissions to get access to that file because it is security sandboxed by default. How essentially Wasm works, very simplified, is you write code in any language, right? Python, JavaScript, Go, Rust, whatever. That is compiled using an SDK, such as Spin, to a Wasm file. Now, this Wasm file can run in any platform, any architecture, any operating system, as long as it runs a WebAssembly runtime. So in this case, maybe Wasm time. Think of it as sort of a virtual machine, right? But just that it's independent of platforms, architectures, and so on. And that's how WebAssembly becomes portable. You can write code in all of these languages and run it anywhere. So 
For something like this to work, you have to think of the contract between operations and a developer as it is right now, especially in the case of writing serverless apps. What it looks like is you have a proprietary software like Azure Functions, AWS Lambda, Google Functions and so on. And your function either lives in Azure and your entire microservices architecture lives in Azure. And typically, your Azure function will not work with your AWS Lambda serverless function. Right? It, you are locked into something like an Azure. Or at a slightly low level, you have a container and you have container registries such as OCI or maybe you're in the Kubernetes ecosystem or you have an app running on a virtual machine. Really, we are seeing a future where there's something called a component model, where essentially everyone is writing certain components that do very specific um, tasks, which all can work with each other, regardless of the language that they're actually written in. So going back to that example, you can write code in whatever language you want. You can actually use libraries from all over without knowing what the other language really is because of how WebAssembly works. And essentially, WebAssembly takes care of the rest. Again, just this blows my mind, so I hope it's blowing your mind as well. Imagine writing a JavaScript app, but using a YAML parser that's written in Rust and using a date formatter that's written in Python without really knowing how to write Rust or Python, or honestly, without even caring that it is written in Rust or Python. As long as your YAML is parsed and your date is formatted the way it's supposed to be, your JS app will run. That's what the component model unlocks. Essentially, any WASM um, server-side app or any WASM app is made up of WebAssembly modules. Now, these can be written in things like Rust, Go, C++, and many more, and they're compiled to a core WASM module. Each of these modules are portable because we said it can run anywhere. Their binary size is very small, so you're saving on money and you're saving on carbon footprint as well and time. Uh, it's isolated by default. It has very fast startup times and no cold starts. These are completely open standards, so you know you can run it anywhere. With this recent launch of the component model, one of these modules can work with another almost seamlessly, right? In a way that you can compose applications. So you see component A dot wasm, which is a core wasm module on your left, and you see component B dot wasm, a core wasm module on the right. Now, one can export the thing it does and the other can import the thing it wants. And this way, you can write it again in Rust and Go and really have them work against or rather work with each other to create a new component in this case, which is component C. And you can see that stack like thing in white next to the WebAssembly logo. That is actually your memory. As you can see, your export and your import is not really interacting with the thing that your business logic is working on. So because this is the security sandboxed by default, we are actually creating interfaces for each component so that they can talk to other components in the WebAssembly ecosystem. That's what the component model really is. Here is an example of how this would look like in production. On your right, you can actually see on the top, there's something that says business logic component, and there is an export. And this business logic is the logic you as a developer, right? Now, maybe you want to have authentication and authorization for this business logic, but you don't want to write it from scratch again. So you can actually use a component that does auth for you. So here is in the middle, an auth middleware component. Right? And you can actually see that um, it's, it exports and it imports, basically it's, there is an interface for it to talk to your business logic. And then at the very bottom, you have your uh, WebAssembly or your WASI HTTP implementation, which could be either on Spin, on WASM Time, on Nginx Unit, WASM Cloud, and so on. Essentially, you can see how these different components are independent components of each other, but they are working with one another. So if you're writing business logic and you want an auth middleware component, you can go ahead and do so. All you need to know is that it exports and imports and that's how it interfaces with another component. In fact, here is a demo that I'm going to show you and I'm going to show it to you very quickly, but you can check the entire code base out on our GitHub right there. So this is a middleware component that the engineers at Fermion wrote 
which essentially does authentication and authorization via GitHub. Right? So imagine business logic is already written. Um, I've, I've built this program and I'm running it locally. And then I open it in my browser, right? And I've, it's not yet authorized. So I'm going to click on login. Now, when I click on login, it authorizes using GitHub and it, it authenticates rather using GitHub and then authorizes me to then access the business logic because I'm now an authorized user. And if you look at the code, you can see different components for authenticate, uh, authorize and a callback which I've originally added to my GitHub app that I did earlier. Uh, again, we don't have time necessarily to go through the code base entirely, but check it out for yourself and see if it works. Um, I think it's a very cool example of how the component model can work in practice. So what are some of the advantages of this component model? Well, like I said, you can write programs in multiple languages and get different functionalities and not really suffer from that 2400 hour problem that we spoke about. But I'm going to give you a couple of scenarios related to security where this component model can shine. Now imagine there's a vulnerability in an upstream component. In this case, we are imagining a vulnerability in the auth middleware component. The good thing is it doesn't actually affect your entire program. Your business logic can remain the same. The underlying uh, layers of your WebAssembly runtimes can remain as is. You can mitigate this by simply pulling a patch upstream component of this middleware, fixing whatever vulnerability was there, and everything goes on as is. In fact, to take this a step further, the Bytecode Alliance is working on something called WARG. Check out warg.io, which is in development right now, which is an open source registry protocol for things like WASM packages. So in the future, you will on WARG, you will see something like an authorization or authentication middleware that will be a standard that you can use in your WebAssembly app and not really care about its implementation so long as you know that it is, it's working. Similarly, let's look at a scenario where there's a vulnerability, but this time in the business logic. Again, the layers below it are not affected because we have successfully written it in a compon componentized manner. So all you can do is mitigate by rebuilding only your business logic. There's really no need to rebuild any other component. No need to rebuild the middleware. No need to rebuild the underlying bosom layers as well. Once you patch your business logic, everything again works as is. So each of these components sort of work individually and are there is a layer of abstraction between them, which makes this very powerful in terms of security. And look, let's look at a scenario three where there is some problem in the platform itself. So in this case, we are saying that your key value store in your WebAssembly cloud is probably down. So in this case, the host component, which is an SQL component, is not embedded in the application. But here, the platform provider handles this and mitigates this problem. So whoever is giving you the cloud, like say it's a Fermion cloud, will fix this. And then again, your entire program works as is. So again, your auth middleware is not affected. Your business logic is absolutely not affected again because of the componentized nature of how this program is built. Now you can see why this excites me and it should be exciting you as well. Also, just to give you another angle of why the component model can be amazing is to look at costs and sustainability. Right. Typically, these two are related proportionally. Uh, if you have like smaller binary sizes, you're being more energy efficient, but that also reduces your compute storage and networking costs. So you save money as well. If you take an example like a conventional CI CD, on the left, you see a simple uh, CI script basically for Go. It's a popular script. You'll find it on GitHub. There are multiple Go versions for multiple OSs. And essentially, when you're packaging this, you, when you're doing a build, you do OS architecture language, multiple versions. Uh, for test, you do your operating system and architecture to package. This is a lot. Similarly, if you look at, literally, this is from the Docker documentation, you can see that there are a bunch of platforms, labels, outputs, all of this done in a Docker container. But imagine if all of this was built in a componentized or component model fashion. This is what it would actually look at, right? Where you have a build which 
is your build. So in this case, let's call it the Wasm 32 Wasi Preview 2. Your test, basically, you just need to test one thing, which is your runtime. Because this runtime, we know, runs in every platform, architecture, OS, and so on. So all you have to do is one version of this runtime. And you don't really need to package anything because the components are already packages. So you don't have to package anything. Honestly, I don't even need to put numbers or, you know, benchmarks for this because I think you can only tell how much more efficient in terms of costs and binary sizes and packet sizes and networks and uh, storage sizes this will be. And just to add to that, WebAssembly in itself is already way more lightweight than some of the other technology we've been using in the past. So you see why the component model really is the next evolution for WebAssembly. So, I hope you're excited about this. For next steps, it's time to build your first Wasm app using Spin. You can just check out github.com slash fermion slash spin. It's completely open source, so check it out. If you want to read more, you can read the, read the blog post about it's time to reboot software development, which speaks about the 2400 hour problem. If you want to dive a little more deeper into the tech, check out the post about composing components with Spin. If you want to get started building in WebAssembly and Spin this month in December, there's the advent of Spin Coding Challenge, which is designed to get people, you know, interested in building in WebAssembly. There are prizes as well, so check it out. Hope you learned something new today. Uh, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or Twitter or email or wherever you'll find me online. Uh, go check out WebAssembly and server-side WebAssembly and the component model. Have a good rest of the day and see you soon. Bye.